Thank you. Thank you. We can turn up the, the lights. I'm not very high tech here. I've got my little note cards to try to keep me on time. I plan for about 35, 40 minutes. I'll try to get you out at least before you need to go to the breakout session. But let me start by saying that I'm honored to be asked back to speak. Um, you know, it's an honor, but it's also places a responsibility on me. The first time you go somewhere, if you get up and do a halfway decent job, then the people appreciate it and they clap and go on. But whenever they invite you to come back, why, it means that they have certain expectations. And you feel that you have a responsibility to try to live up to those expectations, and if you don't, they may not be as happy. But I'll try to do what I can to live up to that. I want to start by saying that, as I do many times, that what I say is my truth. It, it's what I believe to be true. And if your truth is different from mine, well, that's all right with me because I don't think any of us should be so egotistical as to think that only we have the truth. My truth's changed a lot over the years. I speak my truth with convictions because I know why I believe what I believe, and all I ask is that I think if you're a truth, you need to know why you believe what you believe. And we need to listen to different people in different voices, including customers and neighbors and people in general. I want to talk about agriculture of the future, the local food system in relation to that. But the one thing I can say with virtual certainty about the future is that the future will be very different from the past in agriculture and elsewhere. I think the future will be more different in the next 50 years than it has if you look back to the last 50 years. And part of that, I think we'll have a lot more women. We'll have more cultural and racial diversity within the agricultural system than we have today. But it's important to recognize that the worst assumption you could possibly make about agriculture in the future is that it will look like agriculture of the day. So what I want to talk about is the status and the future of the local food system. And I'll start by saying that local foods is not new. It has been here before. And if we want to talk about the future, the roots of the future are in the present and the roots of the present are in the past. And so if we want to understand what's likely to happen in the future, we need to have some understanding of what's gone before and where we are today. The big questions, I think, is why did we change from a local food system to the industrial global food system today? And why are so many people across the country questioning today the industrial food system, the global food system they have, and asking for something that's fundamentally different? And I think the answers to those questions will shape to a great extent the future of the local food movement and the future of agriculture and food in this country. Until very recently, local foods was the most dynamic, if not the fastest growing sector within the food system. But according to the agricultural statistics, it kind of staggered out, it kind of leveled out, as you heard from Ben earlier today. In the 2008 census, we talked about the census of agriculture, the 2008 census showed that over the past five years, there really hadn't been any growth in local foods. And it came out at $6.1 billion. And by the way, I have a paper that will be available that have the references to all of this. But in 2012, it was $6.1 billion, which showed no growth and was only about half of the early industry projections during that period, uh, for that period of time. Also, we saw after the farmers markets had more than quadrupled, a five-fold increase between 1994 and 2015, which would have been an annual growth rate of about 8%. Between 2015 and 17, farmers markets numbers only increased about 2.5%, a little over 1% per year growth rate. And so you heard others say that it seemed like the local food movement might be kind of plateauing out or it might have reached its peak somewhere out. But then we got the 2015 numbers from USDA, and I applaud our statistics from USDA. They're great. In 2015, their estimates were that local foods was $9 billion, which was up almost 50 percent, or almost, yeah, about 50 percent from the earlier figures. And so began to question, you know, we had a leveling out in numbers of farmers markets, but the local food movement is moving again. 
So the advocates of local food would say, we're simply going through a transition. There was a pause after the recession, also in organic. We've gone through a transition. We're headed to higher levels with a fundamentally different kind of local food movement in the future. Whereas the critics say, well, it was just another fad and soon local foods will be a distant memory like so many other fads have been in the past. Which will it be? Well, let's go back to the past and see if we can find something about the future. As I said before, the local food system isn't new. We had a local food system before. When I was growing up back in the 1940s and early 50s, we had a local food system where I grew up down in South Missouri. I suspect that 90% of our food probably would come within 50 miles of my house. What we didn't grow there locally, we had local processing plants for livestock and animals. We had local canneries. We had a local flour mill where we floured the mills when they provided the products for the local grocery stores, the mom and pop grocery stores and the local restaurants at that time. And basically the only thing that came from elsewhere was like coffee and bananas and maybe oranges once a year that came into the store. It was local. But within a period of time of about 40, 50 years at most, we saw those local grocery stores were all replaced, the mom and pop stores replaced by big supermarket chains, and the restaurants were replaced by McDonald's and, and the other fast food places. And those local canneries and flour mills were replaced by large multinational corporations that buy and sell products all around the world. See, that was a time of change that we we're talking about there. It was a time of change. And if we look back today, where we are today, I would say that there's probably rare, you'd have a hard time finding any community in this country that gets more than 10% of its food from local sources. And it's probably much less than that in most areas because even the most optimistic estimates put local food at somewhere around 3% of the total. The estimates of how far food travels within the country, food that's domestic is somewhere between 15, 1,700 miles. We import about 15% of our total food supplies, about 50% of our vegetables, and more than 20%, I mean 50% of our fruit and more than 20% of our vegetables come from other countries. We've gone from local kind of into a global food system. We've gone from independent family farms to a large corporal food systems that we have today. I think we're in another period of time now that's similar if not even greater than that time of change that I talked about early on when I was a kid. I think the local food movement is the cutting edge of that change within our food system. And I think if you look 40 to 50 years in the future, you will look back at a transformation from an industrial global food system to a sustainable local food system. You see, organic had been on the cutting edge of that change until up to the 2000s. Organic food sales were growing at a rate of 20% uh, per year during the 1990s and up until the recession of 2008, which means they were doubling every two or three years during that period of time. The latest estimates are organic is about $47 billion, about a little over 5% of the total food supply. But organic fruits and vegetables now, or organic, yeah, fruits and vegetables more than 14% and the dairy products up to 8% now. So a rapid growth in the market. But during the 90s and early 2000s, with the increase in popularity of organics and profitability, we begin to see organic move from the smaller independent family farms and processors and regional certification into more into the industrial food system, particularly with national certification. And over time, we begin to see changes within the organic food system and where more and more people looked at the system and it looked more and more like the industrial food system that it was replacing because the same companies were involved. It was no longer small farms, it was big farms that were producing the food that moved into that system. And so we saw then what many of us refer to as the industrialization of organic. And as we saw that, when we began to see more and more consumers begin to lose confidence and trust in that big bureaucratic system. And that was what I called the birth of the local food movement, was in response to an eroding confidence and trust in organic. 
You see, in order to understand what's going on with the local and with the organic system and what happened yet, then we need to go back to the roots of the organic. At least the modern organic system in this country, the food system, began back in the 1960s. It was the back to the earth people that really started that movement. And it was the beginning of that movement, it was clearly a rejection of the industrial food system with the agricultural chemicals and technologies that came out of World War II, with the use of pesticides and commercial fertilizers. There's a group of people that decided they didn't want to eat that food, and so they decided they would grow their own food. They grew for themselves, they grew for other people within their communities. They started the first national, natural food stores and the cooperatives around the country. And they were looking for a different kind of food system, but it wasn't just the food system they were creating. It was really about a different way of life because the communes and the places, the communities they've held in, it wasn't just about food, it was about sharing relationships with people that shared their common values about what kind of life that they wanted to live. Organic to them was as much a way of life as it was a description of their food. That whole movement kind of remained on the fringe during the 70s and 80s, but then it broke into the mainstream during the 90s. And when it broke into the mainstream, as I said before, then we saw organic then begin to shift to local, but I think we need to understand that the local food movement was born out of a eroding confidence and trust in the integrity of organic. And then in addition to the growth in farmers markets I mentioned about in the 2012 census, we saw that there was something like uh, the CSAs had grown to 1,200, I mean 12,000 CSAs from practically nothing with farmers selling direct at 50,000 people in addition to the farmers markets that we saw growth in, in that period of time. But I think what we're talking about now is we're talking about a new transition and that's why we saw kind of the pause and the move out because I think the most important thing now that's happening in the local food movement is what I originally called multi-farm CSAs where farmers that CSA running one by yourself is a really difficult job intellectually, emotionally, physically, the whole thing. So more farmers started joining together and several of them they would divide up the task of running the CSA and so they formed multi-farm CSAs and those evolved into alliances and cooperatives and collaboratives and a whole range of different things where their farmers coming together. And in the paper I referenced several of them I know personally like grown locally in northern Iowa, Decorah, Iowa, Iowa's bounty in southern southern Idaho rather, Iowa's bounty, Viroqua Food Co-op in Wisconsin, good natured family farms out of Kansas City. Uh, Good Food Network identified what they call food hubs, about 300 different food hubs across the country or the, the networks. And these, these collaboratives will run from like a couple of dozen farmers that are grown locally to a, a couple of hundred farmers, which is good-natured family farms, to even more than that that are selling together. And everywhere I go, I run into people that are doing the same thing, and most of them aren't counted and don't show up on anybody's list. These food hubs, the 300 food hubs, there's probably maybe more than that, but it's hard to tell, you know, whether it's just a group of farmers getting together to serve the industrial food system or whether it's farmers that are networking out of those shared social and ethical values that are driving the local food movement. You know, it's, it's important. Well, one of the things with about the food hubs is in the account that the USDA come back in the state of Iowa, the Leopold Center, they, they identified I think it was 14 uh, food hubs in the state of Iowa and the Leopold Center was working with something like 60 at that particular time. So we don't know what's really out there. This movement is so diverse and so dispersed and so different. That's the reason we don't have really credible numbers about what's going on. And the food hubs are an attempt to kind of scale up and if the local food movement is going to grab a significant share and probably I think replace the market, then we've got to scale up, we've got to reach more consumers. But the important thing to realize that if you compromise the ecological and social integrity of the system in the process of scaling up, you end up being pretty much like the food system that you gained your success by trying to be different from. That's a lesson that we need to learn. 
The biggest challenge that we'll have to do is to scale up, reach more people without compromising the integrity of the process. The industrial food system, I think the local food system is more important than the organic system in terms of the long run transition. Now organic obviously is more descriptive because everything is local to somewhere. You know, in southern Iowa, I can get all the local pork I want. We've got CAFOs, confinement animal feeding operations that produce thousands or hundreds of thousands of hogs within 50 miles of my house, but that's not what I'm looking for. The local food movement is more important because you can't have a large commodity, commodity producing operation and sell a significant portion of your total production locally. You've got to sell to a large scale production processor or a food distributor of some sort and they can't sell a significant portion locally. So the local food system is tailor made for smaller farmers that want are not willing to develop a relationship with their customers. If you ask people why they buy local, and they've done a number of surveys, and there's references to surveys in the paper there, that they will typically say, well, it's freshness and flavor, sometimes nutrition. People have learned that when they buy from local farmers who really get the product to the market and get it to them quickly, then it is fresher, and when it's fresher, then it tends to be more flavorable. And if it's produced on good, healthy soil, then it's more likely it's going to be nutritious. And the industrial food system can't replicate that because they have to ship product. They've got so much product, it has to be shipped a long way and it has to be picked for reasons other than flavor. It has to be shippability and shelf life and things of this nature. And unless they're willing to maintain the overall integrity of the soil with respect to the biological activity, it's not going to be as nutritious and the studies there support that. So it's important that local food system is a particular niche that fits the smaller farmers who will grow with ecological and social integrity. Another reason that you ask people when they buy locally, they want to support their local farmers, people that they know. They want to help them succeed economically. And just a rough penciling out, if you look at local foods that are produced locally and sold locally, you have about four times as much local economic activity associated with local food production and consumption as you do with the industrial food system. But it's not just about economics. The studies also show, and I think it's consistent with what I've said, is that the social values are important. That's what people will risk consistently. They want to contribute to their community and feel connected to the farms and the land and the places where they are. They're looking for farmers that they can trust, not just farmers to produce good food, but farmers who are committed to being good neighbors and good stewards of the land. If you think these intangible things are unimportant, then just simply look at what happened, that's happening to the organic movement and why people are going toward local. And I think it's important if you're involved in the local food movement, you need to recognize, and I am an economist, that it's not just about economics. The economics has to work. But folks, economics is a means to something more. You look at the dollar in your pocket, it's not worth anything except what you want to get with it. It's a means of something else. And if you allow the means to become the end, to become the gold, then you go right back to the industrial food system that we have today. Local foods is about community, it's about ethics. More important, it's about a vision for a fundamentally new, different, and in my opinion, my truth, better food system for the future. What we're talking about here, every, I think, is a transition to where we could see virtually every community in this country would have a local food system, a community-based food system. They wouldn't produce all of their foods. It wouldn't be self-sufficient, but they wouldn't need to. And I think each one, of those, each one of those local food systems could connect with other food systems, other communities of like-minded people, and they could produce food that would have the same sort of, reflect the same social and ethical values across the community to your developing a network. 
I think the important thing about local foods is you, is you build the, the trust and the integrity of the system out of personal, personal, person to person relationships among people who know each other and care about each other and people who feel a connection to the land in a particular place and to caring for that. And when you have that integrity ensured within communities and you develop relationships among communities, you can develop a whole network of regional, national, international community food systems that are interconnected through relationships that are personal in terms of trust. The quality and integrity is a reflection of the so shared social and ethical values among these different systems. I think it has the possibility, people are always asking me, do you think it's actually possible to do what you're talking about to change this system? And my answer comes back as saying, I don't underestimate the difficulty. I don't underestimate the resistance, the tenacity to hold on to the status quo by people that have great political and economic power. But yes, I think it's possible. And in possibility, there is hope, if not optimism. So why do I believe it's possible? Well, I have several reasons I'll go back to, and it's advantage, again, of being an old man. First one is, is I lived through the transformation of the local food system to the global food system, industrial food system that we have today. And I can remember back when I was in grade school, whenever the teacher would let the kids go outside, when the old steam engine would come by, going from one farm to another to do the threshing, everything else was done with horses. That was the beginning of the industrial food system there. I can remember my mother going to the local grocery store and she would take the grocery list and give it to the man behind the counter and he would go back and get cans off of the shelves and he would slice bacon off the stuff that was in the meat case and he would measure up, you know, so many pounds of beans and would total it all up and put it in a brown paper poke as we called them back then and give her her grocery ticket, how much we owed for the groceries that week. There weren't any supermarkets. I can remember the first supermarket was a Piggly Wiggly store and people saying, you're gonna go in and let people get stuff for themselves. I saw the first, I saw the first uh, franchise restaurant when I went to college. I, I saw all of those things today. And those things, that whole transformation of that system happened in a period of 50 to 60 years. And it happened one person, one farm, one grocery store at a time. We made that change, we can make a bigger change as we go to the future. I saw it happen, I know it can happen. The second reason is we got more good reasons to change today than we had back then. Back then, it was mainly a matter from the farmers concerned, we were gonna take the drudgery out of farming and we were gonna take the drudgery out of homemaking as we called it back then. We were gonna make things easier and we did to a certain extent with the mechanization and the fertilizers and the chemicals and various other things of that nature, but the most important driving force that changed farm policy and food policy was that we were going to make good food affordable to everyone. Food security. I bought into that whole idea of the industrialization of agriculture for that very reason. I spent the first half of my academic career promoting it because we were going to make agriculture more efficient, it would bring down the cost of food, and we would have good food for everyone. It was a noble experiment, but it failed. Why did I say it failed? We have a higher percentage of people in this country that are food insecure today than we did back in the 1960s. About one in, about one in eight people, 13% of the people are classified as food insecure in the last census, they took, brought it down from before that, and about one in six children in this country live in food insecure homes. That's more than it was when the documentary CBS and Hunger in America ran back in 1967. We can't feed poor people by just simply trying to make food cheap. It's a deeper problem than that. We're gonna talk more about that in a breakout session this afternoon. We have to get beyond this idea of thinking that the economy is gonna solve everything. It wasn't. In addition to that, we hold a whole range of diet health related issues. We've got an epidemic of obesity and heart disease and diabetes and high blood pressure and a bunch of other health related diseases. And they're related back to this whole industrial food system that we feel. It was well intended. 
I spent a good part of my life doing it. I was part of the get big or get out, farm for the economic bottom line. And I come to the conclusion that it didn't work. And I'm not gonna dwell on the issue, but that whole system we created is not sustainable. It's not ecologically sound, it's not socially responsible. We're doing great damage to the environment, rising public health risk. We've destroyed rural economies and rural communities. It's not sustainable. We can't continue doing it. Number three, we don't have to go back to the drudgery that we had before. You saw some of it in Ben's presentation this morning. We have all sorts of human scale technologies, most of them not developed in this country, developed elsewhere and brought in here to where we can take the drudgery, we haven't take the work out. If you wanna go out and make a living farming, you don't have to join a health club to get exercise. You, you, you gotta get the exercise, but not the drudgery of farming that I grew up with. You have the walk behind equipment, you have the solar powered electric fencers and, and pumps today that have revolutionized the whole concept of managed grazing and free range and all of that. And we can increase the productivity dramatically and make things work out here. So we've taken the drudgery out of that farming to where it's there. And you can have a good life on a farm and you can make a good living on a farm this day and it doesn't have to be a large farm. I picked up on a blog piece that was written by uh, a young, farm, young farmer. She was a female farmer, but she farmed with her partner somewhere up in this part of the country. I was gonna look it up and see where she was, a Chelsea Simpson. I don't guess she's in the crowd today. But anyway, they, she and her partner had farmed for about 10 years, and I read her blog, and she said, so you want to farm? She said, well, that's good. We need more farmers, but there are certain things that you need to know if you want to be a start, start farming today. She says, number one, it's hard work. Really hard work. Not drudgery, but hard work. Like I say, you don't have to join the health club. It's still there if you want to make a living on a small farm. She says, number two, it's not just farming. You have to know how to do a lot of other things. You know, the plumbing and taking care of animals and crops and a whole range of things that you have to do on the farm. Electrician and engineer, the whole range of things. Number three, she says it's dangerous. You can get hurt farming. Machinery and animals and things of that nature. Number four, it takes money, particularly to get started, to get a piece of land or to get it started in it. But number five, she says, it's the best work you will ever do. And I quote from her at this point. She says, do you want to, to feel completely satisfied and fulfilled by your work? You want to lay your head down at night knowing that you're doing something that helps the planet and your fellow human being. There is nothing more satisfying than providing a basic need, food. She says, I love what I do and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Sore muscles, financial risk, and all. I tell people, don't start farming unless you feel that farming is a calling. But if it's your calling, if it's your mission, don't waste your time doing anything else. You can make a good living farming on a small farm. I was recently at a conference up in Canada with a young couple, Jean Martin Fortier, this French name, so I'll probably mispronounce them, Maud Helene Disrochius, uh, Montreal, Quebec. They farm an acre and a half. They've been doing it for 10 years. Gross $100,000 a year and that's 60% of that to pay for what they put in from their time and effort into the farming operation. He moved on and started a farm demonstration working with something else, and she does most of the farming herself these days on the farm. His new farming project, I won't attempt to pronounce the name, but you can see the reference in the paper, is a demonstration, and I quote from that, he says, how diversified small-scale farms using regenerative and economically efficient agricultural practices can produce a higher nutritional quality of food and more profitable farms. He says, if there's one thing I've learned through all my years as a farmer, it's that if we're going to change agriculture, it's going to be done one farm at a time. All we need is for more people to be willing to go out there and just do it. You can make a living on a small farm and it can be a good life on a small farm. We're not only taking the drudgery out of the farming, but we've taken the drudgery out of homemaking and that's increasingly important for food security. 
because it's not like when my mother, you know, had to build a fire with a wood stove and bake and do all the cooking and do all the washing in a, a scrub board and things of that nature. We have all kinds of things that have taken a lot of the drudgery out of homemaking, a lot of drudgery out of, out of food preparation. And I think if we want to solve the hunger issue and food security issue, what we're going to have to do is recognize that those people that have less income can have, still have good food if they're willing to learn to prepare the food, much of the food for themselves. We've learned from the chefs that if you start with really good food, it doesn't take a whole lot of preparation to fix a really good meal. You know, you can do things with a relatively little preparation. We're spending 80% of what we're spending on food today is not for the food. It's not for what the farmer produces, but it's for convenience, packaging, trust me, packaging and uh, processing and transportation, advertising. You take all that stuff away and you start with the basic food product and you help people learn how to select and produce food for themselves, then everybody can afford good food. We're not going to feed everybody by making food cheap. We need to feed everybody by helping them understand how to buy food that's really good and nutritious and prepare it for themselves. My number fourth reason for thinking is possible is that we have all of these new digital communications technologies and things today that it can transform not only the way we relate to each other and can help farmers keep in contact with their customers and customers with their farmers and can supplement the face-to-face -face relationships that are essential, not replace them, but supplement them. But also the digital technologies is making it possible for a whole different way of distributing food. I think we can have global, we can have local food networks, they call them now electronic aggregation, where all the farmers that want to sell locally can list what they have available week by week or day by day and somewhere in the central location and every customer that wants to buy can go there and get it. We can assemble the product and move it back out. You want to see the feasibility of that? Hello Fresh Blue Apron. They deliver eight to 10 million meals a month directly to people's homes. They have to be carrying it from a lot of different places going out. It'd be much more efficient to do that within our local communities. Food retailing is changing. Retailing is changing. Amazon.com just bought out Whole Foods. What do you think they've got in mind? Bypassing that whole industrial system. Those are the kind of changes I'm talking about. And the fifth, the local food concept, is just a part of a much bigger movement talking about the Hartman Report, which is a retail report, and they talk about one of the 10 major trends that are changing in this country is people are beginning to connect health levelness and wellness and sustainability. They're putting it all together and recognizing that wellness and health is a part of a broader issue of reestablishing authenticity and integrity in all aspects of their life, food and everything else that goes with it. I think the national challenge, you know, is to to scale up and deal with a whole range of things. And as we begin to deal with things such as water pollution and depletion and species extension and global climate change and fossil energy depletion, it will change everything, including our food system. And part of that's dealing with social and ethical adjustments. And when we begin to change and we change policies, We'll change from the policies that has supported the industrialization of agriculture that I was a part of. We'll change the policies that will support the sustainability of agriculture and change can happen very quickly. And we move from food security to food sovereignty and recognize that everyone has a right to good food and begin to develop systems that we'll talk about in the breakout session to do that. It's all tied together by shared social and ethical values. And when we're committed to that within our communities, where we know people and care about people, we will find that we can have enough good food for everyone, and we can have a good life and a good living for the farmers that grow it. My final reason for believing that it's possible is I think there's a great awakening in this country. There's a great awakening that we're not just material beings, that everything doesn't ultimately boil down to economics. I hope there's a growing realization as an economist that money is simply the means to an end. We need to know what we want to use that money for. Certainly we're material beings and we need the things that money can buy. But I think there's a realization that we're also social beings. That's the way we're created. We need to relate to other people. 
for reasons that have nothing to do with what we will get in economic value in return. We need to care and be cared for. We need to love and be loved, because that's what we are. And finally, we need some sense of purpose and meaning in life. We need to know that what we do matters. We need to realize that taking care of the earth and taking care of each other is not a sacrifice because it gives purpose and meaning and quality to our lives. We need to realize that producing good food is not just about producing fuel for the body. It's about feeding the human heart and soul. And in that kind of spiritual awakening, there is always hope. The future will be different. My hope is that you people, particularly you young people, will bring that hope to a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.